afternoon. We are live yet again with the Christian Recorder Dialogues. We are here for our Women's History Month celebration. You know, yesterday we had Stacey Abram. Today we are blessed to have with us speaker Adrian Jones, the first woman, the first African-American speaker of the Maryland House of Representatives. To introduce, Reverend, to introduce Speaker Jones, we have with us today her pastor, the Reverend Dr. Charles Simbley of Union Bethel, Randallstown. Dr. Simbley, if you could say a little bit about your before we begin. Thank you, Brother Thomas and Brother Hobbs I'm de and Sister Walker. I'm indeed honored to have been invited to uh, share in this very, very special event. I want to present to you at this time, uh, Sister Adrian Jones, uh, who, is, has, who is a lifetime member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, she's a faithful Christian. She serves as a steward, chair of our Commission on Christian Social Action. She exemplifies a, a humble spirit and is providing stellar leadership and has been responsible for enacting some historical legislation. So in keeping with her spirit, ladies and gentlemen, Sister Adrian Jones, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Pastor. Chuck, take it away, and we will hear from Ms. DuPont Walker later in the broadcast. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Brother Thomas. Thank you, uh, Dr. Assembly, and welcome, uh, Speaker Adrian Jones. It, it is my honor to be here with you uh, this afternoon and welcome you to our dialogue. Uh, when I usually start these off, I like to ask uh, the individuals who are being interviewed to discuss a little bit about the importance of the AME Church in their background. Would you mind uh, enlightening our viewers a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, the AME Church is, is extremely important to me. When I, The area that I grew up was a historical African-American community. Um, next door to where I live was Calvinsville AME Church. So um, every day I um, would see that church when I lived there. My father was uh, one of the trustees and he also was a uh, the Sunday school teacher, and he engaged us on many occasions for his program. So, so when your, your dad asks, you know, you don't say no. And I feel that um, being an AME, um, it fits in, in in terms of the whole issue of social awareness and and, and action. I think of all the. Uh, of, of the uh, various denominations, I think the AME Church is um, far as the strongest in that area, and and that's um, why that I'm you know right now I'm a um, I currently as Pastor I men mentioned a member of Union Bethel AME Ramblestown. So um, so to me it's AME all the way, and that's what has gotten me through some of these times that I'm dealing with. Now, you know, as as it relates to the various personalities I have to deal with. So I think about my AME uh, upbringing. So. I definitely understand that. And I look forward mm -hmm. to talking about these times over the next few minutes. And we want to welcome everyone to the show. Mm -hmm. And if you can, as we always ask you, if you can drop a line in regards to where you're from and what's your home church. And Speaker Jones, I am from Tallahassee, Florida. I am a member of Bethel AME Church. I'm down in the 11th Episcopal District uh, under the leadership of Bishop Adam J. Richardson and my pastor is Dr. Julius McAllister. And so with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started. Another background question. What or who inspired you to get into politics? Well, uh, like many people, I was, I was involved in a lot of individuals' campaigns um, from mayor, county executive, et cetera, and I worked with Baltimore County government. Um, I, was, and I was asked by the governor at that time, um, the, William Donald Schaefer, uh, they needed a woman to be on the state central committee because they were lacking. They had plenty of men that needed women and I was selected and you know during that time um, you know a couple years later one of the delegates in my district um, passed away um, and I was encouraged to apply for her position you know I first I was reluctant at the time 
because I was dealing with health issues with my mom. Um, and But uh, I was as pushed by my senator and the county executive, because I worked for Baltimore County government at that time, to um, go and apply. So I said, okay, I applied and 16 other people did. And I was selected um, to, to fill out the remainder of her the delegates um, term. And I, you know, that was back in 97. And so I, um, um, from that, um, I, I first thought, I said, well, maybe this isn't for me because during that time, there weren't many people look like me and I, I would see some of the uh, white gentlemen that would get up on the floor. And to me, they were just talking loud and saying nothing. Mm. I would be I was I would be at my office reading the bills. And I said, well, maybe this is not for me. Um, and in the year 2002, the speaker at the time lost his election and um, I was asked by one of the committee chairs, I got a call on uh, no November 20th, 2002, um, at 8.30. You might want to know why I know that, because, um, well, both my pastor and I share that birth date, November 20th, mm. but I remember. And the call asked me, uh, this was from the uh, chair at the time, he was the chair named Michael um, Bush, uh, Chairman Bush, and he said that it looked like the the speaker was going not going to make it. That he was going to go for speaker, and would I be his speaker pro tem? And of course, I said yes. And uh, um, he and I were speaker and speaker pro tem for 17 years to his passing, um, which led me um, to become speaker. And I must. I must tell you, and Pastor Assembly is aware of this, it wasn't something I saw. It. There were others who did. And I didn't, when he was going through his illness, I didn't feel that, you know, should be really putting himself out there. So, um, and, and there's two individuals that applied and neither one of them got it. And so I was asked, you know, in the room, this is with the Democrats, and they said, "Would well, um, they selected me?" And to much to my surprise, because uh, I, I joke said, "If I'd known about that, I would have worn something else." But anyway, that was another story. <laughs> so I became the first woman, first African American woman speaker in this country. In, in this country. Um, and not in this country, in Maryland. In this country, I'm the third. So um, that just tells you where, where we are. But in terms of African-American men, yeah, currently 11, I believe 11 um, that are now. But in the history for women, this, this was it. And there, I'm the 107th speaker. Um, of course, 106 before me were all white males. So wow. you know, this, this is a, you know, it, it's 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 something that I don't take lightly. Um, I love public service, and this is you know it's a way of really trying to make an impact in in the community. That's how I saw this position. So, absolutely, uh, and congratulations, yeah, definitely sure. congratulations mm -hmm. to you mm -hmm. on attaining uh, that elevation elevated rank. And with that in mind, you know one of the things when I was preparing for today's session and was learning a little bit more about you is that one of the things that you have committed yourself to being the first woman, being the first black woman in the position is to pursue a black agenda. And what that struck me, because obviously we are coming off of four years under President Donald Trump. Uh, we all uh, we talk a lot on this show and other platforms about what that has meant for black people in regards to the racial climate in America. But we now have President Biden in the White House, a uh, Democratic majority uh, in the House. We have a, a split that can be broken uh, by Vice President Kamala Harris in the Senate. With that in mind, I want to talk a little bit with you about that black agenda and whether you believe that the climate is ripe in Maryland for what it is that you seek to accomplish. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
although the governor is Republican, uh, both the House and the Senate is majority um, um, Democrat. And Maryland has the uh, largest uh, Black caucus um, membership, legislative Black caucus membership in the country. Um, and so it, it, it wasn't an issue in terms of our, you know, in terms of our members and, and the fact that this is something, and I, I look at it this way, if not now, when? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, and it's something that is, is needed that has, that has been needed for a long time. And this is, is this any time to be able to do that? It would be now when you have this um, uh, woman who happens to be an African American woman who knows uh, some of the areas and live that, unlike the 106 others before me. So, um, you know, it's, it's time um, to uh, address this. And I haven't had a, a, um, not a pushback on it from for both obviously not in terms of our um, African American um, um, members but um, there were in terms of our uh, Caucasian colleagues there wasn't you know they, they fully understood so and it and it, and it does has things or are, are just um, you know, that makes sense. You know, it makes sense to be able to to do, and I, and just a matter. There are like several bills, and I gave them to various caucus members, and um, you know, some there areas that deal with uh, corporate uh, boards boards, um, making sure we had in the past there there were bills that passed about getting uh, women on corporate boards. You know, this in terms of the in terms of African Americans. Um, we also deal issues regarding housing to build, um, you know, um, housing within the community um, and be able to give uh, alternative means for people who can can get these get get accepted for applications. You know, if they have a history of paying their rent on time or utility payment, some kind of alternate um, means that be able to help in that vein. Um, and then there is a, you know, there's some of the common sense things that should have been done. You would think been done, hasn't been done. We put it in the, in that bill. Um, you know, so we, uh, we wanted to, uh, make sure that we have more minority participation in our, um, um, public contracts. So some of these are just, uh, common sense. And I met with about three dozen local, state, and national leaders, um, you know, develop this approach to um, addressing systemic racism. We also, um, we also had uh, established and stated that um, racism is a public health crisis. So we, that's part of this agenda as well. So, you know, this is something that's going to go on. Bills are being heard from the various area, areas that is covered. And um, um, I think it would be something that our, our general public would would um, adapt. Cause we heard from, I heard from some other states uh, of interest as well. So I, so I think it's something that's, that's needed for the state of Maryland. And um, we're, going, we're going forward with that. And as these bills get heard through um, this session. Absolutely. One of the issues that you have brought up in the past in the media has been your concern about environmental justice in your state. Uh, can you talk to our viewers a little bit about how um, members of our community, the black community, have suffered environmental injustice in the state of Maryland? Well, as Maryland, um, as many may you know that we're a coastal state, so the effects of so like sea level rise will impact us greatly, not just in areas on the eastern shore, but um, areas in and around Baltimore. And as hurricanes and storms become stronger and more frequent, the severe flooding as a result of these storms could uh, devastate, in particular, our communities. Um, so 
our House has introduced legislation to help local governments get a jump start on environmental remediation and resiliency projects to help protect these communities from the worst effects of climate change. So it's sort of like getting ahead of the game, because we know what can, so we want to get ahead of the game. Um, um, African-American neighborhoods also have a history of poor air quality, so we're taking important steps towards cleaner air. We introduce a bill to uh, transition all of our gas-powered school buses to an electric fleet. We also have legislation that takes um, black liquor out of our renewable portfolio standard. Um, black liquor is a paper mill byproduct that increases our greenhouse gases. And additionally, we passed a bill on the floor um, last week to establish the Office of Climate Council. And this council will provide oversight to make sure we're on track to meet our clean energy and other environmental goals and make sure that this doesn't have a uh, um, indefinite, uh, definite impact on our communities. Yes, ma'am. Now, I also want to turn our attention a little bit to what's going on up in Minnesota, as uh, many of us have seen from the headlines this week, Officer Derek Chauvin, uh, the individual who we all watched last year, uh, take the life of George Floyd uh, right before our eyes on video. He is on trial this week up in Minnesota. Jury selection is still ongoing as we speak. With that in mind, I do recognize that you have your own efforts that you would like to seek to make sure that protections that have been provided to law enforcement officers in your state, uh, regardless of what circumstances might be with regards to their interactions with unarmed citizens, that that gets addressed. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, your concerns, first of all, in general, about the George Floyd situation, uh, Ahmaud, uh, Arbery, Breonna Taylor, all of the tragic deaths that we saw last year. Can you talk a little bit about how that impacted you, number one? And then number two, as the Speaker of the House of Delegates, how you would like to see this addressed in your state? Okay. Um, there's no question that policing in America is broken. Um, as a state, we have to take uh, bold measures to ensure that everyone feel safe that we restore the relationship between law enforcement and the communities that they serve. I formed the uh, Police Reform and Accountability Work Group um, earlier this year um, to help address this issue. Um, the work group met with advocates, law enforcement and uh, officers, and um, I, I, I remember the one of the hearings that I sat in on listening to mothers who had lost their sons. And one was a, a mother who's a member of my church, Union Bethel. Um, and, and we and knew that um, we had to have some strong recommendations for police reform in Maryland. Um, I sponsored and introduced two bills that work to provide greater accountability and transparency in policing. Um, the, uh, the bill strengthens um, our use of the use of force policies and requires independent investigations for police involved shootings. And the other bill will provide more access to police records to shine light on officers with a record of misconduct. Um, there are other bills that were assigned to other members, but the, the basic is that, you know, I, I go from the premise that, because we had some of the police officers wise contact us, uh, the majority of police law enforcement uh, um, officers do the right thing. But there is a number that, that, that this does not occur. Those are the ones that we are addressing. The uh, what the the, the George Floyd with this case is going on now, Breonna Taylor, and other names that um, that we all have gotten to know and know their the, what happened. Those are those are the individuals that we are are, are addressing. So we we repeal the 
law and off law off law and <laughs> law offices bill of rights um so but it wasn't just to say okay we're just taking it away we we're we're doing things that um uh, okay this makes more sense in terms of 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 how we want to see that relationship between the, the police and the um community uh so we, um, like I said, we got feedback from um, a lot of the community, some persons, their personal stories. And based on that, that was the legislation that we um, used to do this uh, bill. We're going to be debating this, the second the session I'm going to be residing in a little later on um, today in about a, you know, a couple of hours. So, um, so um, it should be, uh, I would anticipate a long debate, you know, between what happened with the, the parties and, you know, the, the who's on the, on the other side. There's a difference between the perspective of the um, Republican Party and the Democrats. So, but we just wanted to make sure that, um, you know, taking consideration families who had suffered and uh, these officers that sometimes they have not been addressed or they just been dismissed. So we just want to make sure that what we do is the right thing um, for the, the community and actually for both parties. Absolutely. And I'm going to go out on the line here. We're going to watch and see what happens there uh, as you all continue to debate this very important issue. And I can foresee that perhaps my editor uh, Mr. Th John Thomas may have you back on again at some point in time to discuss if this actually gets to the governor's desk at some point in time and we get to see some meaningful change uh, in, the, in the great state of Maryland. Uh, with that, I, I want to talk to you a little bit also about the coronavirus. Uh, last year, those were the two major issues. One was uh, social justice with regards to all the people who are dying. We just addressed that at the hands of law enforcement. The second major issue clearly was the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, I keep seeing, thanks to Facebook memory, uh, the fact that this time last year was when everything really started to shut down. And it's not just me, but a lot of my friends are posting uh, the last time they may have been at the movie theater, the last time they may have been at a beach or, or, or able to actually socialize without maintaining social distance and wear a mask. And here it is one year later, uh, it looks like there may be some improvement on the way, but it is still very frightening for so many of us across the country, particularly the black people who are being impacted disproportionately with regards to deaths from the coronavirus. With that in mind, can you talk to us a little bit about how the rollout is going in the state of Maryland right now with the vaccine? We know that the vaccines came online back in December. Uh, there have been some rollout issues in many of the states. I can tell you that down here in Florida, my home church, Bethel AME, has been at the Vanguard since early January. Every um, Every other weekend or so, people can come get the vaccine. But one of the biggest issues we're having down here in Florida is encouraging black people to actually go ahead and take the vaccination. And so, you know, I've been doing my part uh, in regards to my blogs and on social media to try to encourage people. I have been vaccinated just last week. Um, and so with that in mind, can you talk to us a little bit about how the rollout of the coronavirus vaccine is going in your state? Uh, it could be better. Um, we, they are just the governor handles that uh, as it, as he his um, the state health department um, will allocate those to the counties, you know, et cetera. But what is happening, say, in a um, area such as Baltimore City? Uh, the vaccines may be distributed there, but there's people from all over who do not look like the majority of the residents that are in this Baltimore city um, are getting them. And we still have um, um, areas where some of the are in our community are reluctant and they're, you know, looking back in terms of the uh, the Tuskegee's and the Henry Allen Blacks, and and I and I tell them when we have conversations, I, I say that um, um, 
because some of the the uh, vaccines they were um, worked on by African Americans. Um, you know, there actually, a couple of people that I do know, and and I said that you know this it's already been trial. They're not going through trials, um, and I think it's safe to get. I've gotten um, mine because before we went back in the session, we had to have, you know, um, our members had to have it. Um, you know, but we still do social distancing. But I think that uh, we could do a better job in uh, getting the word out. There are some counties, um, the counties where the county where uh, both Pastor Assembly and I live, Baltimore County, the county executive um, had also made arranged for if you're a certain age group cannot get to the um, the vaccine location that they will pay for Uber or Lyft driver, you know, for you. So there, there are attempts to be made, but about we're waiting on some of the uh, additional vaccines that our, um, our, our federal partners um, that we're relying on getting it from, from there. Cause there's, there's supposed to be a certain number that's will be going out. We just need a better, way of allocate, allocating them to the various areas that um, need them the most. Yes, ma'am. And in regards to not just the coronavirus pandemic, but with regards to health issues uh, in the aggregate, what are some of the things that you believe that the House of Delegates can uh, do in Maryland to make sure that the gap that continues to exist between the uh, allocation of health care and access to health care for black people uh, and other racial minorities can be bridged between the people of color as as opposed to uh, our white brothers and sisters who seem to have fewer problems being able to have access to quality health care. Uh, one of the ways that we're doing is um, we're bringing the whole issue of health equity to the forefront. And my the, our house, House delegates, have introduced several bills that, um, in an effort to close some of these race-based health gaps, and one was to start closing these gaps. One way to start closing these ga gaps is with, um, uh, which we were, we, a bill has for bias training for all healthcare professionals. Um, uh, this and this bill going to be introduced this this session. Um, I think it already has been already been heard in the committee. So, because if you, if you're a healthcare professional and you have a certain bias, we don't want you on any of your weight and think that or generalize. We don't want that. We, we want to make sure that they have to all healthcare for all all levels that they would um, they would uh, get this um, training. And we also have a bill that designate certain health equity resource communities as a way to reduce these health disparities uh, and a way to improve access to primary care and improve health outcomes for our underserved communities. So basically we're, we're um, doing sort of like a triage and make sure that they're not left out. And, um, and we, our members are living up in all areas, but in particularly, um, uh, those are in the uh, most underserved um, and communities of color that they get that special direct, um, you know, attention. And we also, um, like other areas, have been doing expanding the telehealth service um, for those who just aren't able to get out to better for better access and to you know improve health out health outcomes. In, in, in these communities. And again, we have legislation that will expand telehealth service so that more Marylanders and you know, persons of color can get the care they need when they need it. Yes, ma'am. Speaker Jones, I just noticed also that there's breaking news that uh, United States Representative Marcia Fudge has been confirmed by the United States Senate as the next uh, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development under President Joe Biden. With that in mind, uh, one of the other issues when we're talking about a black agenda in the state of Maryland, housing uh, is, an, is an issue all across America. 
I know it's a, an issue in your state. How excited are you to know that uh, the Biden administration will have a strong civil rights voice and soon to be Secretary Fudge uh, in the top spot at HUD? And in what ways do you see the Maryland uh, legislature being able to work with the federal government in regards to making sure that black people and other people of color do have access to affordable housing uh, in, in, in your state? I'm very pleased that it finally, she's finally confirmed and it makes a difference. Uh, and, and my relief is I think you, all, all one has to do is look at what the past four years were with the, the other guy who was the president and what did not happen and how people were um, left out. And I, I just feel that, um, that there will be more direct communications, um, you know, that there will be more um, communication with the our, our federal partners with us. We do have a good relationship now, but I think with that, that just it just it just it just I'm just very pleased to, to see that, and I see some uh, good partnerships happening, and um, and I and I know that. The communications that was lacking um, during this past administration that would not be occur. Could we get correspondence or, or um, constantly from our federal partners and, and also in terms of directly from the um, White House itself? Yep. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Perfect. Now, mm -hmm. Jones, one of the things that I didn't get to tell you in the introduction is even though I grew up in Tallahassee, Florida, uh, I was a military brat. I'm the youngest of uh, four siblings. And so I didn't get to do most of the major travel across the world, uh, the Germany tours and all of that. But I did a fair bit of traveling. And one of the last tours that dad had before my father uh, had in the military before he retired from the army here at Tall in Tallahassee was in the state of Maryland. I lived from the age of four until a little bit after my eighth birthday in Oxon Hill, Maryland. And so with that in mind, what's interesting is having, you know, when you're four years old on through to about third grade, that's when you're starting to become more aware about history and, and, and things of that nature. You're getting your introductions into it. And so what was interesting is when we moved to Florida and even years later, when I went off to Morehouse College as an undergrad, you know, every now and again, I would meet people who would pretend as if Maryland did not have a Jim Crow legacy. Uh, like many other other states in the deep south. And I used to sit there and think like, wow, you all are sorely uh, mistaken in regards to what was going on south of the Mason-Dixon line. I was like, I guess in their geography classes, they weren't talked about that Mason-Dixon line and Jim Crow in Maryland and or in the District of Columbia. So with that in mind, I want to talk a little bit about HBCUs in particular. I know that Maryland, much like in Alabama, much like in Mississippi, uh, there has been litigation that has gone on through the decades with regards to the inadequate funding that historically black colleges and universities received. A lot of people are not who might not be fully aware of the whole separate but equal uh, edict under Plessy versus Ferguson. The problem was is that most of these southern states had it separate, but they didn't quite adhere to the equal part. And so since the Brown versus Board of Education decision, it has been an uphill battle for uh, blacks and or the leaders of these universities and colleges to be able to get their fair share of funding from their state legislatures. With that in mind, I do know that you uh, are passionate about this issue. And I want to talk a little bit about how Morgan State, Bowie State, Coppin State, Maryland Eastern Shore are going to fare under your term as Speaker uh, of the House of Delegates with regards to funding. Enlighten us a little bit about that. Okay. So let, let me go back prior to me becoming speaker. Prior to that, I was the um, chair of the um, Capital Budget and Education Subcommittee in which I had, um, you know, the funding for uh, the HBCUs. When I became, and, and I had put, because of Capital Budget, you can put additional funding in. I, I, could, I could do that for on the capital side. Um, when I became speaker, um, the and I'm sure you you're aware that there was a 15-year 
lawsuit that through various governors, um, it didn't get resolved. Um, I sponsored the bill that I had. Um, it was the first bill, House Bill 1, um, in an effort to resolve this ongoing litigation around uh, Maryland HBCUs. Um, the, the, the bill passed the committee overwhelmingly um, and with only, I think only two dissenting votes. Um, and this case started back in 2006 on the heels of an agreement with the Federal Office of Civil Rights to resolve Maryland's history of segregation, higher education. Um, the state won in federal court on the issue of funding. Um, and as I mentioned, when I was chair, I made sure that um, that they were appropriately funded to be on par with the traditionally white institution during my tenure. But the judge in the case found that Maryland had engaged in a pattern of unnecessary program duplication, meaning we did not allow the four HBCUs to keep up with cutting edge ad academic offerings in order to compete for the best and the brightest students in Maryland and beyond. Um, this, this is the legacy that this bill that I, that's, I was the sponsor of and intend to resolve. Um, so that the what the what the law what the bill says over a, we spread it out over a ten year period um, the is be a special fund to require the go, require the governor to dedicate five hundred and seventy seven million over this ten year period to the four um, HBCUs that you had had referenced. Um, uh, and because of, at that time we were in some um, funding co constraints. So it won't begin until, start beginning until next um, July, July 22. And the money is to be spent in five major areas of support to eliminate the vestiges of program duplication. That's establishing new programs, investing in existing under-enrolled and unutilized programs, investing more in scholarships and financial aid programs, recruiting new faculty and training faculty, and providing additional academic support to students, and marketing new and under-enrolled programs to att attract new students. So, and this funding is intended to supplement what they currently are getting through the, uh, U, uh, the uh, USM, yeah, the uh, USM and HBCU funding it is divided based on enrollment so we can capture part-time students who have the same needs as full-time students. Um, and it it also directs the, the four universities to work with the University of Maryland, which is a global campus to explore online programming opportunities, as well as hire a consultant to help with the planning for expanding programs. So, this is what the bill, bill does, and um, it's going. Is there's a Senate version as well, and I'm very confident that it will get through. And uh, the governor, because we were trying to get the governor to um, uh, not override, but so that's why we went this route to go around. It. Absolutely. And with that in mind, just as a side, we, we obviously will continue to watch that issue with regards to our HBCUs in your state well. But what's your relationship like with your governor up there? I know that oftentimes he is uh, depicted in the mainstream media as being more of a moderate, uh, so to speak, uh, far less uh, fire breathing, uh, red meat Republican, so to speak. But I, I want to give us the real. What, what's it like working with your governor? Well, he, let, let me do a clarifying statement. He is interested in running for president in 24. I'll put that out there. So um, he would meet with the president and I um, maybe once a month um, and talk about issues. Um, he's on the he gives information quite a bit as it relates to this this COVID. Um, he is 
he has high ratings in the uh, in the state, um, based on exactly what you had said. Sometimes he view, view them as a moderate. Um, it all depends on who you're talking with. Some of the unions aren't happy, but um, you know, for the the, the most part, um, you know, my my issue when he you know vetoed you know, some of these bills and why he he done that. So, and I have no problem being frank with him. So, but anyway, but uh, um, um, he we 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 do certain things we have to do. Um, like he can't get any. No bills can go in effect unless I sign and the Senate president sign along with the speaker. So, and along with the uh, governor. So, um, you know, so we have to work on those efforts. We have done some uh, uh, promotion type of things when, as it relates to the, uh, the uh, COVID-19, you know, we, we did think at, in terms of the community event, we did a bill, a major bill that was dealing with the Relief Act, that it was a bipartisan. We did some tweaking, so we, some of the things that we wanted in here from the Democratic perspective, but it wound up um, getting passed, and it, it, the areas that were covered will help a lot of people. So those type of things that you know we can we can work um, you know positively on. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. I appreciate your candor uh, with regards to the working relationship with Governor Hogan. It's always interesting to me uh, these days as we continue to work on what's crucial to our community. There are times uh, in all of our states where you do have to cross aisles and uh, it seems as if, uh, you know, you have a, a, a better chance of, of getting some things done up there in Maryland with your Republican governor than we do down here in Florida with our Republican governor, Ron DeSantis, who really has tried to fashion himself as uh, the 2.0 version of uh, the former president. So again, okay. with that, uh, I wish you well up there uh, as you continue to uh, try to cross the aisles to make sure that you think your constituents continue to receive everything that you believe in their best interest. With that, I also have one uh, final question and then we're gonna open up and bring on uh, Speaker DuPont in a little bit, um, my sister uh, Jackie DuPont Walker in a few minutes. But with that, Speaker Jones, let me ask you this. One of the other areas of redress that uh, has been critically important over the last 50 years since the end of the civil rights movement has been sometimes set aside programs or earmarks or anything that would help to um, level the playing field, so to speak, when it comes to government contracts, uh, be it in education, be it in business and things of that nature. You know, we, we have found in the last two decades that there has been quite a bit of pushback from many of our white brothers and sisters. They've even coined uh, the phrase that I totally believe is a fiction, which is reverse discrimination, so to speak. Um, you know, when you have small slivers of pies being cut up uh, for the minority communities and yet they want the whole pie still. And so I fight against that a lot uh, down here in my state of Florida. But with that in mind, what are your thoughts about affirmative action type measures? I don't have a better phrase to call them, but uh, how important is it for minority businesses to be able to compete legitimately uh, for state contracts and or federal contracts and what have you that are being doled out? Just saying in this way, for more than two centuries, the United States has implemented policies that have systematically and disproportionately suppressed black communities. Um, and that's why we heard some of the things that we're trying to do here, the steps we're taking to reverse a system inequality isn't a handout. So some people think, well, you know, you just give, no, it's creating equity that hasn't existed before. And it's about time and more needs to be done. So for those who um, um, are critics of those types of programs, um, that's one of the reasons why some, what you, you've heard, and I just, get a, I just gave you a highlight, um, it gives an opportunity that has not been there because it, it, they just saw it as, uh, framed it as tokenism. 
So no, we just want to make sure something that makes sense, that is doable, and it's and, and it truly we benefit um, those of us that look like you and I. Absolutely. And again, Speaker Jones, it has been a delight for me uh, to speak with you and I hope to be able to speak with you again. Uh, sure. With that, I am going to yield the floor to Sister Jackie DuPont Walker. And then after she has an opportunity to speak with you, uh, the next voice that our viewers that you will hear will be from my boss man, uh, Editor John Thomas III. And again, it has been my pleasure uh, to interview Speaker Adrian Jones this evening. Sister DuPont Walker, you have the microphone. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chuck. Uh, you are, in fact, uh, challenging us in many ways. And the interview that you have provided today is indeed an inspiration, not only to those of us who are baby boomers, uh, but the millennials uh, who are looking to see what God has called them to do. Uh, you challenged us to say who we are. So let me share. I am a native of the 11th Episcopal District. In fact, the same church as our host, Mr. Hobbs, Bethel, Tallahassee, around the same time as his bishop, uh, Bishop A.J. Richardson, who was there in Tallahassee. I am an itinerant layperson. I found my way to the sixth and the fourth. And uh, yes, speaker, I was in uh, the second at Robinson in Graysonville uh, for some four years before coming to the fifth, which is where I am now, uh, in Los Angeles at Ward Amy Church under uh, Pastor Johnny e. Cager and our Bishop Clement Few. <laughs> Today, you have shown the spirit and it's taken me back many, many places. You have shown the spirit of Esther because you are here for times such as this. You have demonstrated the spirit of Harriet Tubman who understood the urgency of getting freedom for her people and her role as a champion. You have shown what Jarena Lee must have felt when she was ready to do what was needed without the title. And when the title came, she was more ready. Uh, you have demonstrated Rosa Parks, a laywoman in the African Methodist Episcopal Church who understood a calling to social justice and a champion for all people who had quiet strength that could not be denied and could not be ignored. And yes, um, you are third to Karen Bass, but second to none, uh, who was the first woman, uh, black woman, who was elected speaker of a state assembly. And as my current Congresswoman, I see two of you as kin people in the service. You mentioned uh, the coronavirus and you are the uh, Kismikia Corbett of Maryland, uh, creative in doing what needs to be done in governance. And more than anything else, you the authentic Adrian Jones, a bridge builder, an equity champion, a role model, an activist, a trusted voice. Please know, Madam Speaker, that today your constituency has grown from the people who vote for you in Maryland to AMEs around the globe. I looked from the 17th on the continent of Africa, from the 19th, from the Caribbean. Today, your constituency has grown. We will be praying for you and ready to work with you in your church. The African Methodist Episcopal Church is very, very strongly in support of who you are and what you're doing. Count on the Social Action Commission. And I am thrilled to know that you are chair of your local church's Christian Social Action Commission. That means you and I are linked and you can't get away from me. Know that AME V Alert is ready to activate the voter base. We are not gearing down from 2020. We're gearing up for 2022. So AME V Alert is ready to go. Know that Editor John Thomas is relentless in what he does. Editor John Thomas found you. So there's an AME over in Maryland. Can you believe it? Uh, as a baby boomer and him as a millennial, it does work across generations. I get on his nerves sometimes and you get on his nerves too. Whenever you have something to publish, he has the oldest continuously published document by people of the African American African descent, not African American descent. And he is a champion of getting the word out. Use him, use us to make it happen. So know that no matter what we bring, we are comforted in knowing you are fortified by your faith. And when we see you going out, we know God has told you that that's the mission. We'll only be looking to see how we can undergird you and ensure that as God has called you for a time such as this, we are there to 
support you, and to love you. So you are blessed to have Reverend Simley, who I've known for some 40 years. Uh, you have a shepherd shepherd. And so know that today is just the beginning of our walk together. Uh, we thank you for your witness to this point, And we can't wait to see how God is going to use you. Thank you for being with us today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And with that, we'll bring in, there he is, Editor John Thomas III. Take it away, sir. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all very much. Again, uh, we are thankful for having everyone here today. Thank you, Speaker Jones, for being with us. A couple of announcements before we go. I just want to reiterate to our viewers that we are celebrating Women's History Month. And for the record, um, Speaker Jones is the highest ranking AME state official currently, and also is the third African-American woman to lead or preside any state house in the United States. You are watching Black History, Woman's History, American History Today. A few announcements. First of all, we would like you to, as always, continue to support the Christian Recorder, um, $36 a year, best bargain you could get, and it allows us to continue to bring you this programming. So please continue to support us through your subscriptions. Visit our website, www.thechristianrecorder.com. Also, our partners and our publisher, the AME Church Publishing House, we are currently in Lent, and you can visit IamAME.org for your Lenten resources. Also visit them for your worship and publishing needs at amecpublishing.com. That is amecpublishing.com. Also, again, Lent, if you have not purchased your Lenten Daily Devotional, you can do so on amazon.com. Right now, we are out of print copies, but you can still get an electronic copy. And you know the budget of the Christian Recorder has been cut 25%, and we rely on our sponsors to help give you this important programming. Today's sponsors are J. Augustine for Judicial Council 2021 and Eldridge for Treasurer 2021. And our next dialogue will be next week. We will continue our AME HBCU series with Edward Water College, and we will have as our host Morgan Dixon interviewing the president of Edward Waters College, Dr. Zachary Faison. You don't want to miss this. So as we end one more time, I want to bring back all of our guests. And again, we just celebrate and thank all of you for making this possible. And again, remember, we are celebrating Women's History Month. We are celebrating you, Speaker Jones. And we want to thank all of you today for making this possible. Now, bless you, Reverend Simply, for making sure that we got her here on time and getting her here with us. Thank you, Mr. Paul Walker. Thank you, Chuck. And we will see you again next time. God bless. Thank you.